OK, so I don't have paper airplanes today, so this will do. So last time we talked about the internet and the World Wide Web, if you recall. And so just very quickly to review how the whole system works, we have this notion of computers that are connected to each other. Uh, the connections can be made through cable or through Wi-Fi, through radio signals. Um, and then we have this idea of internet protocol. And all a protocol means is a rule. It's something that everyone agrees on, right? And so the idea of the internet is how do you send a message from one location to the next? That is to say from one device to another. And we talked about the internet protocol, which is this idea that once you've given an address to each node, to each device, you can then send a message, not necessarily directly to that device, but to a device near you, a device that you are connected to. Then that device can route it to the next device and next device, and eventually the packet or the message that you're sending will eventually arrive to its destination. And this is what the internet protocol provides us. And the address that we're referring to, this number that each node has, is known as an internet protocol address, or IP address. This is a 32-bit number, but soon we have IPv6, which is the next version coming out, which will be version 6, and that will have 128 bits. Again, just a number. Many of you who use the internet, don't actually write these numbers in your browsers. Instead, you write a domain name like facebook.com or apple.com or aua.am. Eventually, these names have to turn into numbers in order for the internet protocol to work. The process by which we understand or we map from the name to the number is known as domain name resolution. And the way this happens is very simple. I go to my computer and I type facebook.com. A message is sent to you. He has a mapping between the name and the number. And so he writes the number on another packet and launches it back to me. I now have the number. I now have the address for where Facebook is, the actual computer that is run by Facebook, right? I then write down the address for Facebook, and I make the request. Once he gets it, he's not Facebook. He's a router, but he knows the direction in which he needs to throw this or pass this on, route the message, if you will, in order for it to eventually propagate, bounce around, and get to Facebook. Facebook will then read the request put in there whatever it wants to send me, and then send a message back in the exact same way until it bounces around to back to me. And now I have the message from Facebook. If the message from Facebook happens to be HTML and I happen to be a browser, I can now draw this HTML on the page. Get it? It's that simple. So I write facebook.com, I go through domain name resolution, find the number, the address, write a request to Facebook, send it. Facebook then responds with the response, which can be an HTML page, it can be an image, it can be whatever, JavaScript. I then load that into the browser and do something with it. Draw it, execute it, whatever. Is that part clear? So the next sort of level above that, above the internet protocol, this mechanism of simply routing a packet or a message from one place to another, is TCP. <coughs> the idea behind TCP is simple. Suppose I want this messaging system to be reliable. So I'm doing a banking transaction, or I'm sending an important message, right, an email perhaps to someone. I want to make sure that they get the message. What happens if while we're routing, while we're sending a message across, a wire gets cut. It can happen. Or a power outage happens, right? These things happen all the time. There are failures that can happen in the system. So the mechanism by which I can be sure that in fact Facebook did get my message or whoever I'm sending to got my message is through the, another protocol called TCP. 
And the way TCP works is this. I send along a package or a message. When the target gets the message, they send another message back saying, I got it. Everything is good. Now that I know they got the message, I can now send another. And in this way, I know for sure that they received every one of my messages. There's also UDP. UDP is used when you want to stream things. Because UDP does not have this, me this mechanism, this protocol of making sure that every message arrives. Instead, the goal of UDP is to stream data, to just send messages. And if one of the messages happens to get lost in the process, that's OK. <coughs> Imagine watching a YouTube video, and one of the frames doesn't, come, doesn't appear. You don't want to stop the video and correct the frame. Instead, you want to continue with the video, and if they miss a frame, OK, whatever. It's not the end of the world, right? So for that, you would use um, the protocol UDP. Clear so far? Excellent. OK, so on top of usually TCP sits HTTP. Now, this is known as the Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Now, the hypertext transfer protocol is typically is the main protocol by which we communicate with HTTP servers. HTTP servers know how to respond to these specific, right, goodness, these specific uh, kinds of requests. Now, there are a few kinds of requests. There is a get request. A get request is when you're asking to get something. Okay, that's a get. There is a post request. A POST request is when you're sending data up. For example, when might you, you give me an example, want to send data to a server? Upload a YouTube video. Upload a YouTube video. Good. What else? Hmm? Up homework, yeah. So for example, I mean a typical thing is if you want to submit a form. So you have a form that you're filling in and you want to send the results of that form to the server. That would be an example of a post. There are other actions that can be performed using HTTP, like put, which is typically used to update something. So if there's already data there and you want to modify it, you would typically use a put. There is a delete. When do you think you would use a delete? You want to refresh or you want to delete something. <laughs> well, uh, how about that? Yeah, OK, that's, you, you gave a more complex answer. If you simply want to delete something, right? So you're making a request to the server saying, please delete this, right? So it makes sense to have a delete request. So you have a get, a post for adding data, a put for updating data, and delete for removing data. Simple? Good. Um, there were a few things that we didn't get to last time. HTTP, HTML, web browser. So these are the earlier web browsers. Ah, okay. We didn't talk about what a URL is. So a URL, or a Uniform Resource uh, Location Service, is it's that address. You know when you go to a browser and you type in like an address in the address bar? You type like HTTP colon slash slash like Facebook.com slash blah blah blah, right? Let's talk about what all those parts actually mean. So here's an example. So the first part, the HTTP colon slash slash, that's the protocol. And what is a protocol? Again, it's just a rule, right? It's a mechanism by which everyone, all the various parties on the network are going to agree, OK, this is how we're going to do things. It's that simple. Think of it this way. Imagine we didn't have a protocol. And I wanted to route something to Vosgen. And I threw a message to you. If we don't agree, you're just going to take the message and do whatever you want with it, right? So we have to have a, a rule that everyone agrees on so that the message properly routes to the target. Simple, yes? OK. So again, so the first part of the URL of the address is the protocol. We then go to the domain name. This is the part that eventually turns into a number. Remember, we talked about domain name resolution. So the browser, if you were to type this into the browser, would take that, just that part that I highlighted, and send it to a DNS server, a domain name system server. 
Again, DNS is simply a mapping between name and number, or name and address. Think of it that way. It will return an address, so this gets replaced with that number. 80, this part here, notice there's a colon here, colon 80. This is the port number. Every computer has lots of ports. A port, imagine, um, here's a good analogy. Imagine you have um, ships coming into your city. You can't have one place for all the boats to come, right? Because each boat needs its own sort of parking spot, right? So what you have is various ports. Each is assigned a number. And when the boat comes into the city, it then simply goes to the right port and stops. Yes? OK. A computer works in a similar way. You might have multiple programs running on your computer. You might have Skype. You might have a, a server running, so sort of an HTTP server. You might have, I don't know, a number of other applications that maybe want to connect to the internet, right? OK. Well, each one of those has its own port so that when the messages come to the computer, it has to know which port to go to to route to the proper application. Make sense? Again, your computer has lots of applications, right? You have data coming into your, to your computer. That data has to go to the right application. And the way this happens is by each application saying, this is my parking spot. This is my port. Come here. Got it? OK. So 80 happens to be the default, typically, the default for HTTP servers. Which is why, very often, you don't type 80. You simply type google.com. You don't have to type 80. Because when the package arrives, the computer will say the port was not specified. It's an HTTP request. They probably mean 80, and it routes you to port 80. Got it? OK. So let's continue. Then you, have, you can do something like a slash search or a slash something, right? This is a path. Everything beyond 80 is just information for the server or the computer that receives your information to know how to respond to your request. You can have paths. You can also have what are known as arguments. Think of arguments as basically variables with values. So think of it this way. In this case, what we're basically saying is, hey, Google, do a search. So this is the hint for Google that we want to do a search. Question means we're about to begin the argument list. The arguments are Q, which has a value of Yerevan, and sort, which has, a value, which has an argument of 1. So almost think of it like a function call, except the arguments are, the names are there, Q and sort, and the values are Yerevan and 1. Somewhat makes sense? OK. This will make more sense once we actually start writing the server-side code and actually start getting these, these values and using them. In fact, that's the very next thing we are going to do. Ah, one more very quick thing. You might have heard of this thing called W3C. W3C, so the 3 for W is www, W3C. Um, it's the World Wide Web Consortium. This is a standards body for the World Wide Web. It was created by Tim Berners-Lee, the father of the World Wide Web. And they are the ones who are responsible for establishing the rules, the protocols, the standards, if you will, by which we all agree. Right? So they are the standards body. Worth knowing. All right. Let's start programming. Yay. I know you guys miss programming. OK, so node is executed using the command line. Hang on. OK, hang on. Let me zoom in from here. OK, can everyone see? Everyone can see? Yes? OK. So for running node, so what is Node? Let me begin with that. So we're going to be using Node.js to help us write server-side code. What is Node? Well, Node is actually a system, a program. It's just an application 
that you can run. And what it will do is it will execute your JavaScript code. It has a lot of hooks and, and sort of functions that you can use to create a server and to run a server. Underneath the covers, it's actually a lot of C++ code, but you as a programmer are interacting with it using JavaScript. It's actually a really interesting uh, architecture. So there are two ways that you can run Node. One is you can just install Node on your computer, which I recommend you do if you can. But there is another. There is a, a website called Cloud9. If you don't have an account there, I recommend you do. It's completely free. Uh, the address is c9.org. Is it org? Hang on. Let me double check. Oh, IO, sorry. c9.io. My apologies. Thank you. C9.io, okay? Create an account there, and I will show you very quickly sort of how it looks. And you don't have to install anything. In fact, for those of you who might be writing other code, like C++ and Python, and all of that stuff is already on that website. And you can just write your code directly in that website. So you don't have to install all these crazy things, right? So I recommend you at least give it a try. It will help you immensely. The only downside to it is it's, it's a website, right? So you have to have a constant connection, and if you lose the connection, you can't code. So that's the problem. But other than that, it's a fantastic tool. Um, so once you have Node, either in Cloud9 or on your local computer, you can run Node by typing in Node. OK, I'm now running Node. Very exciting. So again, remember that Node allows you to execute JavaScript, right? OK, so let's write JavaScript. There, it executed some JavaScript. It executed 2 plus 3. That's JavaScript. OK, let's write more complicated JavaScript. Let's do let a be 2, and then let's say a plus 4. Oh, let me hang on. There, do you kind of see that six? And this zooming feature is not that great. There we go. Okay, you see that six? Okay, you can get out of this by doing a control C. Okay, so as you can imagine though, writing lots of JavaScript just like that by executing one line at a time in command line is probably not very optimal. So the other thing we can do is simply write JavaScript in a separate file just a regular JavaScript file, the same kind that you've already written for your homework for factorial and for the stars assignment, if you recall, right? So let's do that. So here I have a file. Hang on, let me zoom in a bit. It's called node1.js. It's just a regular file. Don't be scared by all this other craziness. It's just a file in a directory, nothing more. Here's what's inside the file. What will happen if I execute this? Exactly, it will print hello world onto the console. Let's now actually run it. So let me type node, node1.js. And hang on, let me zoom out, zoom in, there it is, hello world. You see? Simple, right? So I can use node to run JavaScript files. Now, some of you earlier, if you recall, were asking, well, how do we execute JavaScript? And if you, if you recall, I said, well, you can have the browser execute it for you, but there are other things that will do it as well. And this is one example, right? So you can run your JavaScript inside the browser. You can also run your JavaScript on its own using Node. Pretty cool. Okay, so now let's begin writing some more. Now, as we write more and more code, we don't want to store all the code into one file because that file will become very, very big over time. The, your operating systems, the ones that you use, probably have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lines of code. Imagine one file that has like a million lines of code in it. That would be crazy, right? So instead, what we do is remember, whenever we have a big problem, we break it up into parts, right? Same idea with code. So what we do is we write code in separate files and then we connect them together 
And in that way, we produce complexity. So how do we do that here? So we have uh, this notion of require. So require means I want whatever this reference is. And what is this reference to? Well, dot, this is, so this is a, an address, right? Using a path, a directory path. Dot means current directory. So this is saying relative to where I am, relative to the folder I'm in right now, go into my modules, which is a directory, and then get whatever that is, module one. Well, let's see. My modules is this directory here, and inside there is a file called module1.js. So intuitively, you can begin to imagine that, okay, what this is probably doing is going, loading that file, the file I'm referencing, loading that code into memory, and then somehow whatever it's returning, putting that into a variable called module one, which let's make it a const to be nice and clear. Um, it's putting it into module one, yes? Now let's have a look at what's actually in module one. So module one, bless you, has this exports thing, name, and to it, I'm attaching hello, which is, in this case, a function. I can do exports.foobar and attach one to it. I can do exports.zoo and attach, what else can I attach to it? Yay, how about that, right? So now what this means is that from here, this, think of this module one as the result of the exports object. So now module one has attached to it all of the things that I attached to exports. That is to say it has hello, foobar, and zoo attached to it. Let's give that a try. So module one, let's console log. Hang on, let me zoom in so you guys see this. Okay, so module one dot foobar. Remember how I attached foobar? Right there, you see? Okay, so now let's go here. Here I'm printing foobar attached to whatever this returned and I put into here. Let's run this and see how it goes. Node, node, two, dot js. One and hello world. One because foobar is one. And hello world, and it printed hello world because hello is a function that console logs hello world. Make sense? Okay, let me explain this one more time. You have an object called exports. Anything that you attach to that object will be available to whoever requests your module or requests your file or requires your file. So in this case, we're attaching three things. Hello, which is a function, foobar, which is a one, and zoo, which is a yay. Is that clear? Okay. So then later, when we require it, that is to say when we request that module using this, module one is basically the thing that we exported, which has attached to it foobar, hello, and the third thing. Yes, sir. Yes. So what you could do, can hang on. An object? Yeah. So what you can do is you can say, uh, hang on. I think that you can do this. One second. Let me try. This is an experiment, so hang on. Bear with me. Uh, so now let's see if this will work. So now let's see a, a moment. Yeah, no, no, you're going to have to put that. There might be some way to mix things in. Ah, so there's this notion of mix-ins, but I don't want to confuse everybody. If you're curious, come talk to me. You can basically put all this stuff into an object and then mix it into exports. That is to say, like, merge it in, but separately, okay? We'll talk about it. Okay, so for everyone else, forget about what you just saw. <laughs> Let's go back to this. So just this part, this idea that you have an exports object that you can attach things to, you can stick things to. Yes, you can also stick objects to it. So you can say exports dot 
Uh, AUA is an object that has, say, a name. AUA, it has, I don't know, age of whatever, who cares? Um, so it has that. And then from here, I can say, let me console log um, AUA.name. And then here we get AUA. Clear? Sort of? Okay. Again, just one more time so it's absolutely clear to everyone. We can write our code in different files. Once we've written code in different files, in one file you want to use code written in another file. You require it. When you require it, the, that function, the require, will return to you whatever that file exported. And then you can refer to everything that was exported in that file. Yes? So the module is still a Node.js file? It's a JavaScript file. Yeah, Node.js runs JavaScript. Think of it that way. Keep it simple. Any other questions? Keep going? Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's the first part. So we understand how we can export things. Let me go back to where I started. Okay. So the next one. Wow, this is way more stuff. Let's have a look at what's happening here. So in addition to uh, pulling in files that we've written, we can also pull in files that other people have written. That is to say library files, right? So in this case, we're pulling in, requ we're requiring path and fs. Both of these are just JavaScript files, just like the ones we saw earlier, but they were written by other developers, okay? So specifically path is used for working with paths, directory paths, or file paths. And fs stands for file system. So file system is what you use to communicate with your files and folders. Yes? Can we import some objects to Yeah, you can. So the example I just gave was me just making up a, my own. Right? That was a custom one. In this example, I'm, I'm pulling in things that other developers did. But yes, you, that's the whole idea. Is you want to write your code as separate files, you yourself, and then pull them in. Hmm? Okay. Other questions? Okay. So in this case, again, we're pulling in path and fs. Path, again, helps you work with directory paths, and fs helps you work with the file system. fs stands for file system. Okay. So let's see what we're trying to do here. So the first part, this, by the way, anytime you see var, just pretend it's let. This was written a few years ago. Oh, okay. Whatever, just assume var is let. For those of you who don't know what var is, var is let. Okay, good. Um, so in the second line, or this line here, we're saying file path equal path.join. Underscore underscore dir name is the current directory. It's the path to the directory that this whole thing is executing in. Okay? So then we're attaching that to public slash hello HTML. Join means stick it together. Watch. Suppose you have a file like this. C foo bar. Then you have public slash hello dot HTML. Sticking them together would return, or doing a join, would return this. Does that make sense? Okay, so that's what join does. It takes the current directory and it joins public hello HTML to get one long path. Kind of with me? Okay, so that's what that does. Now, what, what is public slash hello HTML? Well, let me show you. So here, if you go to public, you see I have this HTML here inside of my public directory. So that means this path is saying, go to the path that I'm in now, then go to public, then get hello.html. Hmm? Okay. Okay, then we simply console log some information. 
the path object has, other f has various functions attached to it. One of the functions is join, which again, given two, given two parts of a path, will put them together and make one long path. That part clear? There is a dir name. What do you suppose dir name will return? Directory name, yeah. And, ba and base name? The name of the file, yeah. So let's run just that. So let's forget about all this stuff. Is that a fire alarm? Okay. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So have a look at what, what happened when I ran it. The, the base, the directory is this, right? It's this whole path all the way to public. This is the directory that I'm in. The base name is hello.html. It's the, the part of, it's the last part of the file, of the path. That's it. Now let's start using the file system. Moment. Okay, can you guys see in the back? Let me get one of these pens. Okay, watch. FS is a module that has exists as a function attached to it. Exist takes an argument. Actually, it takes two arguments. What are the arguments? The file path that is to say the path to the file, and a callback function, that is to say a function. What do you think it does? Callback. Yeah, why? Checks if the file exists. Exactly. That's all it does. You give it a path file, a path to a file, like c slash, you know, foo slash hello.txt. You give it there it will call back your function after it has figured out whether it exists or not with a Boolean value, a true or a false. If it's true, the, yay, the file exists on your computer. If false, the file does not exist on your computer. So that's why it's underlined? No, it's underlined because of another reason. Don't worry. That's, forget the underline. It's, it's the editor doing that. So all you have to worry about is that exists checks whether something exists or not. Yes? So if you copy the component, So a path is a separate module that allows you to work with text. A path is just a string, right? It's like C colon slash, you know, whatever slash hello dot world dot txt dot doc dot js. That's a path. The path module has functions on it that allow you to work with that text. Example, suppose I gave you that text, you know, C slash blah, 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 and I told you what's the name in that path? How would you find it? So what you could do is you could parse the path, right? Is you could walk the path, find the last slash, and then maybe take the text immediately following it, right? But instead of writing all that code, you could just do path dot base name. Done. See? Make sense? Furthermore, you might say, why are we joining? Why don't we just do plus forward slash plus whatever? Right? That would join two paths together. But the problem is different computers, different operating systems might have different ways of delimiting the path. Some computers do it this way, some do it that way. There are different rules that different operating systems follow. And so by using this function, it abstracts away or it hides the complexity of understanding how to put things together. It will figure it out for you. Make sense? Awesome. Okay, so once you've used the path module, in the end, you just have text. You just have a path in your computer. C colon slash blah, 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 right? That's all you have. 
The next question is, how do you check if that file is actually on your disk, if you actually have that file? This function will tell you. You give it the path, you give it a callback function, and it will call it with either exists with a true or false, if it does not. Make sense so far? Good. By the way, you see this whole notion of like calling a function, passing in a function as an argument to a function, all that craziness that we went through? Now you see why. You need to know that to understand this. Okay. So if it does not exist, then we return, oh, there's a, something bad happened, the file does not exist. Okay? So we printed a console, there's no file. If it does exist, we do fs.readfile. What do you suppose readfile does? Yeah, it allows you to read the content of the file into memory. Okay? All right, so we read the file. We specify the encoding of the file because different files can have different encodings. Error is, is an object that will get returned if there is a problem. If there is no problem, you will get the data. What is the data? Information. Yeah, it's the information inside your file. I will find any errors. Like this. If error, then you know there's an error. If error is truthy, error is an object. If error is truthy, how it determines whether it's an error or it's all right. Right. So, you with an if statement. How does it get? Uh, how does it? How does it you know whether it's error or it's uh, it object? it. Can you give uh, an example of an error. Like sure. Absolutely. Okay. So suppose you want to. Hang on. Let me think. What's an example of an error that could happen here? Wait. 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 So you check if the file exists. Oh, OK. Suppose you did not check if the file exists. Suppose you just did fs.read some path, and the file does not exist. An example. Exactly. That's one obvious example. OK? So again, this part, all it's saying is let's read from this path using this encoding. If there's an error, tell me. If there's no error, give me the data. And then we're logging that data. Simple. Okay, yes. Sure. So there are different encodings for path, for, for files, for text files. Um, encodings, again, remember I told you about standards? Um, so the internet will only work if there are standards, if we all agree on something. Encodings are the same kind of thing. It's a standard that we, so I'm writing an application that knows how to read data, you're writing an application that knows how to read data. We both have to agree that the data is going to be this way for us both to understand how to read it. Make sense? So this UTF-8 is the encoding. It's how text is stored in binary. So both data is going to be binary. It's all going to be bits. But what does the bit mean once it turns into a character? What is the mapping? You see? We have to have some agreement that this means A, this means B, this means C. UTF-8 is, is that agreement. Sort of makes sense? We'll get, don't worry, it'll make more sense moving forward. Once you see other ones, then you, this will be more clear. Okay? Other, yes? Yes. That's why you take, okay, so uh, the question was asked about asynchronous code programming. So in some programming languages, when you read a file, on the next line of code, you have the file. Okay, so you write, you say, I want to get data from the file. Next line, you have the data. This is known as blocking. So what happens is when your code is running, when, it's, when it goes out to read the file, it will stop executing. The data will get read, and then once the data is in, then it will continue executing. In JavaScript, we have asynchronous callbacks. So what this means is that you're calling this function, you're saying the rest of my program is going to continue executing, but after you get the data, then call my function. So it does not stop your program. That concept of blocking and non-blocking is something we will come back to later. So if you didn't get that, don't worry. I'm not going to quiz you on it. Relax. Um, but hopefully I, under I answered your question. So as far as the steps that we're taking here, checking if a file exists, reading the file, printing the data of the content of the file to the console. 
just that part. Is that clear? Yes? Any questions so far? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, of course. Why can't we, instead of joining the dear name and public hello.html, just console log dear name hello.html? Console log dear name, dear name, sorry, console log what? Why can't we just console log the dear name of hello.html? So it will log all the stuff that we joined. You want to just console log this or this? What do you want to console log? OK, wait. So this is text. This is text. The result of calling this returns text. Here, we're taking that text, and we're taking a part of the text, specifically the part that deals with the directory, and we're printing it. Here, we're ta from that text, we're taking just a name, and we're printing it. So that's all this is doing. Then we say for that text, which is again just a path, we're saying, does that file exist? It's telling us if yes or no. Then we're, we're, this part will actually go to the file, open it, read the data from inside the file, and return it to us in here. What kind of data can you get from HTML? Text. So HTML is itself just text. Yeah. So in fact, let's try it. Why don't we actually run this and see what we get? So let's run node, node3.js. Look what we got. Hang on. See this? That's the content inside of that file. I'll prove it to you. Let me sh show you. So this was hello.html. There it is. So you see how that is the same as, as this? Yes? Okay, so when might you want to read the content of a file? You are writing a program. Why would you ever want to read from a file? Okay, how does anyone here use Word or Excel? Any of those? Okay, do you notice how you like double click on the file and then it like opens? It doesn't open, you don't open a file. What you're doing is you're launching the application called Word or Excel. Word or Excel take as an argument when you double click on the file, it launches or executes Word and gives it as an argument a path to the file that you double clicked on. It then goes to the disk and reads that file in, reads it, and then draws it for you on the screen. You see? Sort of? OK. How about Excel? How does that work? Can anyone tell me how Excel works? I know. I was wondering if you could remember what the same way is. Good, okay. So you double click on an icon of a file, right? Double click. So there are a few more steps actually, and I'll describe them for you. So the operating system checks to see what the file extension is. Is it a .doc? A .doc or a doc file is a Word file. A .pdf is a PDF file, right? Uh, CSV, I think, is mapped to Excel, typically. So when you double click on these files, the operating system will look in a table that says, this extension, use this application. This extension, use this application. When you double click on something .doc, .doc, it maps to Word. It executes Word. It then passes as an argument to Word the location of the file that was double clicked, the path to that file. Word then reads that file in, reads it carefully, and then draws it for you on the screen. That's it. That's how your operating system works. Actually, that's the small part. But that's, yeah, thank you, thank you. Um, any questions about that? OK, so we now all understand how to figure out if a file exists. We all understand how to read from a file. 
Yes? Assuming you had access to this code, you could understand what it's doing. Yeah? OK. Good. Let's keep going. All right, so now let's get, let's, this is where things become interesting. Oh. Mm -hmm. There's a, a word here that we've used quite a bit, server. Dum, 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 dum. Dum, dum, ba -dum, dum. Okay. So, so the first line, so here, we all know what this does again. This is saying go and get a module called HTTP. Again, it's just a JavaScript file that has a bunch of exports. And put the result of those exports into a, a variable called HTTP. Yes? Good. Next. HTTP, just like many of the other things that we saw, like path and FS, is a module that has attached to it things. Specifically, in this case, a function called create server. It takes as an argument a function. There it is. See how pretty? It starts here, ends there. And that function takes two arguments, request, response. In this case, oh, it's also saying, so this calling this function returns an object that has other functions attached to it. And in this case, we're calling a function attached to that object, and we're saying listen to 3001. That, my friends, is the port number. Remember the port number we talked about? So we're saying this server is going to listen to that port number. So requests coming to my computer to that port are going to go to that server. And what's going to happen is very simple. As I get requests, my function will be called with that request. And then response object is another object that has functions attached to it that I can call to send back information. Let's go through this one more time and then we'll run it. Again, we request the HTTP module. The HTTP module has a function called create server. When you call it, it will create a server. You give it a function as an argument that will get called every time that server gets requests for you to then process that request and return a response. You can say listen 3001. This is saying listen to this port number. That is saying when the server is running, Requests coming to this port number are the ones that should go into this system. Questions so far? Let's try it. So let's run this server. Node, node4.js. OK. Notice how it's not finishing. Why do you think it's not finishing? Okay, if, if the program was console.log hello world, would the application finish? Yeah, right? It would print, nothing more to do, done. But when you create a server, it doesn't end. The server becomes active and is constantly listening to requests, so your application doesn't stop. It keeps going. It's constantly listening to requests on port 3001. Okay, so now let's make a request. Now what we've done here is we created a very simple HTTP server. How can we make an HTTP request? Can anyone guess? Yeah, very good. Okay, good. So let's open up our browser. And in the address bar, so we know the port number is 3001. 3001. But we need an address, right? We need a location for my computer. It turns out that there's a simple thing you can do where you just write local host. Local host means use my computer. 
It's, that's all it means. Localhost is just my computer, okay? So let me type here localhost 3001. And let's hang on, let me open up DevTools. Let's go to network and let's refresh. So you see here we did, hang on, watch me, watch me, watch me, watch me, hang on. Okay, so a request was made using HTTP as a the, as the protocol to this address, which is localhost, to the port number 3001. How? Well, I simply wrote localhost 3001 here and hit enter. That's it. That generated a, re a get request to this address, right? Okay, and the response was text. Hello world. And when the browser got that text, it drew it, which is why we see hello world inside the browser. Let's look at the server. What did the server do? Well, the server did a few things. Okay. Remember that each packet, each message that is sent in the internet has a header and the content. You guys remember this? Well, the header is like information, general information about the message. The content is the actual message itself. It's the actual bits, okay? So in this case, in the response, we're sending a code 200. 200, you don't have to know this really, but 200 is like everything is good. It was successful, your request was okay, I'm sending you data. It's one of these. What is what? Oh, there are lots of them. There's 404, like does not exist. There's 500, server error. There are lots of these. Yeah, there's 301. That's, it's, that's that, yeah. Okay, good. So we all know what that stuff is. Good, very good. Yeah, yeah. No, there, I think there are a few others. Okay, look. The second thing is I'm saying add all of these things to the header. Content type. Why do you think that's important? Yeah, it tells the browser, is this HTML? Is it text? What is it? Because it can then use that information to properly render or do something with the file that it gets or the data that it gets. So in this case, we're just sending text, right? Hello world, it's just a string, it's just text. So we're saying content type, text, plain, plain text. And then we're sending hello world as the data. End means we're done. This is the last thing. I'm sending this and then stop. I don't have anything else to do. That is to say, every time I get a request here, I'm always going to send hello world. If you don't write this, then it feels like luck. If I don't do anything? If you don't write this, it feels tough. It will time out. Yeah, it, no, it won't freeze. It will wait and then the request will just time out. The browser waits. If it doesn't receive it in some time, it, yeah, and then there's an error. Okay, so look, let's do some experiments here. Suppose I were to send, I, I changed the location. See, I specified the, a different URL, hang on. See how I changed things here? Hang on. I still get hello world. Let me change it some more. I always get hello world. No matter what I do here, I'm always getting hello world. Why? Because look at my logic, right? I'm always returning hello world. No matter what the request is, the response is always this, right? That doesn't make for a very interesting application, right? Typically, in an application, you want your server to be able to respond to different requests differently. Not give the same answer no matter what the request is, right? Okay, so what we can do is, hang on, something like this. So the request has a URL attached to it. This is the information like to the right of the, of the port number. This is the, the directory path. 
And what we can do is we can check, is that URL hello, for example? If it is, let's send that. If it's not, let's send something else. Yeah, we can send, nope. Oh, look, it's sending 404, which is just an error message saying, usually nothing exists, not found. So in this way, I can check if the user wanted to request this, I'll send them that. If they request, and I could keep adding if statements, right? If this, then that. If this, then that. What's going on? Set your butts down. OK. Is that clear? Yes? OK. Let's experiment with this for a bit. So let's go to, hang on, let me stop this. Node, node5.js. OK, it's now running. Let's go to the browser and go to 301. I got a nope. Why did I get a nope? Yeah, and look, see how it, in the response it's like nice and red saying, ooh, I got a 404, not found, that's bad, ooh. OK, good. So let me go to slash hi. Still nope. What do I have to go to to get this? Hello. Yes. Right? If I went to hello one, nope. Something else, nope. Hello. Yay. Good question. Nope. OK, question. This exact path here, how can I add a handler for this? In here, we have an if statement for hello and nothing else, right? I just copied that URL, the one that I just wrote. How can I add an if statement to check for that? Right, if, else. Hang on, let me move this down. Um, it's not if else, it's else if. Okay, uh, rick.url is equal to that crazy thing that I just wrote. Then let's. And every time I write something new, I should do this operation. You can, there are regular expressions, but we'll get to those later. Um, Okay, so let, now watch this. When you guys start writing node code, if you change the code in your server, you have to restart your server. If you don't restart your server, you're still using your previous code, right? So don't make that mistake. Don't change your code and say it's not working. Remember, you have to restart. There's, a mod, there's something you can install called nodemon that will automatically, it will check if the file changed and restart. For now, just actually restart. We'll get to that stuff later. I don't want to confuse you. OK, so I'm going to stop this code and run it again. OK, so now if I go to this crazy URL, yes, it worked. If I go to hello, that still worked. If I go to anything else, nope. Clear? Really? OK, so in this way, Hopefully, you're now begin. Yes. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, say it again. Uh huh. So for that, you need to, you're right. So that's an interesting question. So here's what you can do. So, okay, so the question is this. Suppose we wanted to match not only this, but we also wanted to match that, I don't know, that. That's basically anything that begins with hello, we want to match with one if statement. That's your question. So remember that request is a request.url is text, right? 
Remember that strings have functions attached to them. One function that you probably don't know about yet, but I will tell you, is called index of. Index of will give you the index of any string that you give it. So if you say, let's say we have a text like this. Right? Suppose I have this. I can then say b.index of hello. What will c be? What's the value of c? What's the index of that? It's zero. What's the index of that? Right, so hello begins with that index, which is one, right? If I wanted to check slash hello, I would do this. That would return zero, right? Suppose I wanted to do that. That would still return zero, but only for cases where there's a slash at the end. So I could do this and say, does the result of this equal to zero? If so, you're inside your if statement. Got it? Now, there, there are better ways to do this using what are known as regular expressions. I don't want to confuse everyone, so don't worry about that for now. Yes? Sure, let's do it. So let's have the port number not be 3001, but let's try a port. Give me a port number. You want to try port, what is it? 42, sure, why not? Let's, let's try 42. Uh, hang on. Oh, can't, can't use that port. It's being used by someone. Okay, let's do, how about this? Nope, hang on. I, I'm using AD on another, I know, because I'm using another program that's using AD. Okay, how about 332? Okay. 3032, random enough for you? It's a random, I just made it up. Okay, so now if I go to the browser and I go to 3001 and I refresh, I get nothing. There is nothing listening to that port. So I have to change it to this port number. And now I get nope, or if I do hello, yay. Okay. I want to give you guys a little bit of context so you understand where we're going with all of this. Let's take a step back for a moment. In our system, we will be writing uh, applications that will have client-side code, that is to say JavaScript that's running inside of your browser, and server-side code, which is code that is running in Node. Typically, the JavaScript that what I'm talking about will be running inside of a browser, and then the server-side code will be running on some remote computer. People who use your application will download the client code and run it inside of their browser. And it will do something interesting. Maybe it's a video game using Canvas. Some of you might do something else. I don't know, some application that you will write. But an application needs data, right? You need images, you need JavaScript, you need CSS, you need HTML, you need all kinds of things. You need data from a database. You need to be able to authenticate people, right? They write in a password, you say yes, it's correct or it's not correct. So the client needs to be able to make requests to the server and the server needs to give proper responses, right? Okay, well you, ha you now know HTML and CSS, so you know how to draw things. You know JavaScript, which means you understand logic. Later, we will talk about how to use JavaScript to modify the HTML, the DOM, the tree, if you will. But that's coming. But once you know that, you will know how to control the client. We're now learning how to control the server. Once you understand the two points and they can communicate with each other, you will have an end-to-end -end solution to build web-based applications. Pretty cool. And again, as you receive requests from the client, on the server you have to understand, okay, how should I respond to this request? A primitive form of doing this is using if statements. But I want you to understand this before we go into 
using frameworks and sort of tech other libraries to help us do this. We will do that, but I first I want you to understand if statements. Clear? <coughs> yeah, sort of. Okay. Do we have any questions thus far? Yes. Online data to do what? So we use the libraries. Yes. Yeah. You can. So there are a few things you can do. So first of all, there is a package manager that comes with Node called NPM, Node Package Manager, NPM. You can use NPM to download other modules and applications, if you will, or other sort of co other people's code. So now you have it locally and you can use it. But you can. Uh, so you can make remote requests, like service requests. In other words, your server can ask another server to do something and get data back, right? But if you want to just use other code, it makes sense to just download that code and use it locally. You see what I'm saying? Um, but yes, you can. Your server can make an HTTP request to another server. In fact, one of the examples, and we will get to this, not today, but eventually, is we will spin up two separate servers and a, and a client. And the client will ask the server, the server will ask a server, the server will respond, and then the response will go to the client. In fact, think of it this way. Have you guys used any peer-to-peer -peer applications to download very legal files? <laughs> legal, legal files, yeah. Okay, so that's peer-to-peer, -peer, right? Every, there's no central system. Every node is connected, right? And the way that works is every node is a client and a server. That is to say, it knows how to send data to other nodes. It can also ask for another node to get data, right? That's how BitTorrent works, right? Yes? This here? Ah, the text plane part? <laughs> So actually, in many cases, this is optional. It, your browser will, will almost default to text, and most things that we send will be text. But if you're sending images and things like that, it makes sense to have a proper header. Yes, this is a fixed list. You can find a list of all the content types online. Yeah, yeah. Uh, other questions? Yeah. How do we find out what's inside of a server? What is inside of a server? Okay, so uh, let, me answer, let me give you another example and you can extrapolate the answer from that. So we know how to read data from a file, right? We know how to check if a file exists, right? Okay, it turns out it's also very easy to go to a directory and get everything inside the directory. That is to say the list of all the files and folders inside that directory, right? And then for every one of those directories, you can find the files and folders inside of that directory. And then for that, and so on. So in that way, you can walk the entire directory hierarchy of the entire server and look at every single file under it, right? So you can use that, for example, to do search. So suppose you want to find a file that has the word, I don't know, Armenia in it, right? You can go through every file, open it up, read it, check to see if that word exists, and then go to the next file, read it, read the next file, read it, and keep track of all the paths that have that file in an array, perhaps, and then print it. And in that way, you've created search. A primitive version of search, but a search nonetheless. Yeah. Did that kind of answer your question? Yeah, I could what you want. Yes. Say that one more time. Yes, we are. Yeah. So one of the main reasons why I chose JavaScript as the programming language for the class is because JavaScript is so versatile and you can do so much with it, right? So I love Python. It's one of my favorite programming languages. The problem is it's difficult to build a lot of user interfaces with Python, right? Whereas with JavaScript, it works great with the DOM, with the browser, and it works great on the server. So it was a good fit for the class. Yeah. 
Other questions? Yes. Wait, wait, guys, guys, I can't hear him. Shh. That's, so that's excellent. So you, you touched on a great point. And in fact, let me echo your point. Uh, if you can't build something, you don't know it. So very, very well said, absolutely. Um, oh, the problem is, is the, the complexity behind the HTTP, uh, is, it's not simple. There's, a, there's quite a lot of code that allows you to build the system. But think of it this way, a primitive version of this, a very primitive version, I'm thinking how you could do this in a browser. Um, imagine you have a variable that has a function in it that has this function, and it's sitting in the browser. And, there, and then you have a text box inside of your HTML. People can type into that text box. Every time they hit the button submit, there's a handler that will call your function. When it calls your function, your function does something and it returns. And that return gets drawn underneath the text box. That's a primitive way of getting a request and sending a response, but it's happening entirely in your browser. Not very exciting. But just imagine a similar kind of a thing where you're, instead of getting your request from a text box, you're getting it having been set from some remote computer. You're doing something, but the response doesn't just render underneath, it just gets sent, and then the client can do whatever they want with it. Sort of? In theory, I know, it's very high level, but I think once you begin to use it, you'll get more comfortable with it. So just give it time. Yeah? Uh, other questions? Uh, it's coming. Probably, what's today? Uh, soon? Uh, how's Monday for you? Is Monday good? Monday is a day today? No, starting, starting Monday until the next. Yeah. Oh yeah, by the way, so I'm, look, I know how much midterms suck. So let me ask you, when are your midterms? Next week. Next week. It's next week? So I'm, I want to assign things to you in a way that it doesn't, because I know how hard it is to study for these, so give it earlier than later. Wait. Okay, wait, wait, wait. wait. Ah, ah. Look, just so you guys understand, I'm on your side. <laughs> so you tell me. I can either give it to you sooner or later. Okay. All right, later. All right, I will give it to you later. All right, good, 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 good. I understand you. Uh, that's what you think. <laughs>